First of all, I want to thank uh, Deacon Russell for allowing me to preach here, and it's actually my first time here in the Tucson Church. And um, I've seen a few faces before in, in Tempe, but uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, well, you can tell by my accent, you know, I wasn't raised uh, apple pie eating and Republican voting necessarily, so, you know, I'm from Germany, and I came here in March of last year, and uh, yeah, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here, and we've read Matthew 25, and by the way, if, if you want to know how I came here and why, you know, ask me after the service. But uh, we read Matthew 25 and look down your Bible in vor verse for 14, sorry, verse 14. The Bible reads, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents to another two, and to another one to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey, and in verse 19 it says, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And I don't have a fancy title for my sermon, but I want to preach about the parable, you know, of the, the talents and these different servants. And uh, kind of want to explain to you what this parable means. And just to give you a little bit of context as far as the timeline of these events in the end times, you know, in Matthew 24, we read about the second coming of, tr of Christ, obviously, and the rapture. And then Christ comes again and sets up his kingdom. Obviously, in between, there's also the wrath of God, which we read about in the book of Revelation. And in Matthew, uh, yeah, in, in the same chapter in verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. So obviously Jesus Christ is not, not with us in the flesh anymore. He ascended up to heaven, is at, sits at the right hand of the Father to receive a kingdom. And I want to compare that. You don't have to turn there. I want to compare that to Luke 19, 12, where the Bible reads, He said, therefore, a certain nobleman, this is the parallel passage, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Also in Luke 22, verse 29, it says, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me. So, Jesus is handed up, he receives the kingdom of the Father, the kingdom of God, and he returns and sets up the millennial reign of Christ on earth. And it says in Matthew 25, 19, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And Revelation 22, verse 12, you don't have to turn there. I just want to quickly go through these verses to set, uh, give you a context. It says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And that verse really sums up what we're talking about here. Jesus is coming again, and he sets up his kingdom, and we will be rewarded as Christians. You know, we will get a reward, and some of you will reign over this many cities, some of you will reign over just the little cities, or you will be, you know, just a doorkeeper, but hey, amen, you know, it's great to be at least in the kingdom of heaven, no matter where you work, right? So, before we actually get into the parable, you know, I just want to say that we should never base, like, concrete uh, core doctrines or core beliefs on parables, we should always base our core beliefs on what the Bible clearly spells out. Like in the epistles where we read, you know, the, the ab abstract doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and so on. You know, and we then read those parables and we can derive principles from those parables. Yes, we can derive doctrine from those parables, but we should always base our core doctrines on clear scripture. And that's really important when we get into this parable because a lot of people misunderstand this parable and they, they're just hell-bent on saying that the servants, they're all safe because it says servants. But you have to realize that a parable is just an example, right? It's just an illustration. So not every single detail we read about in a parable has necessarily a spiritual meaning. A lot of deep de details, but not every single little detail. Okay, it's, it's just an example. It's an illustration to better understand other doctrines or to derive principles, you know. But um, i just read to you again, verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. So notice that the talents are his goods, the Lord's goods. To another two and to another one 
to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. So a talent is a type of currency, obviously, or a measurement unit. You know, there are talents of silver, talents of gold, and so on. Nowadays, when we think of a talent, we think of like a musical talent or talent in, in sports or somebody's very talented in whatever it is. But notice that it says that the talents are his goods. So the talents are not the rewards we get. Those are not gifts we get. Those talents are actually God's goods, the Lord's goods, you know, they're his. So, you know, I, I get where we get this from, uh, that, you know, we think of musical talent or whatever, but it's, it's actually not quite correct because those are not gifts we get. Those are the Lord's goods that he entrusts us with, and we need to work with those talents and increase those talents. And, um, yeah, so those talents are not the reward, and we are stewards over Christ's goods. We need to uh, be good, faithful stewards. And God gives everyone according to his several ability, it says in verse 15. And uh, we should, you know, we should never look down on other Christians in church and think, you know, they have less ability, maybe seemingly less ability, or they have different abilities, you know, and we should never look down on other Christians because they have different abilities. Because those abilities are what God has gifted us with, you know. Ability to maybe serve other people in a practical manner, or the ability to, you know, be a great soul winner, or to have great faith, or whatever it is. And with those abilities, we need to work with God's talents. We need to increase those talents God has entrusted us with, whatever those talents are, and I'm going to get into that a bit later. So, yeah, just, just never look down on other people in church because they have different abilities. You know, it, it might seem cool to have a lot of talents, or just to give you a world example, you know, as a young guy, you might think, you know, it, it might be cool to be the CEO of a big company, but is it that cool, though? Because you have to re uh, also bear the responsibility, right? Like, if, if God entrusts you with a lot of talents, you have to bear the responsibility. And you might not be able to bear the responsibility because you have different abilities, and that's fine. So don't think, well, it, it would be so cool if, you know, I had this many talents or I, I could be the CEO of some company. Maybe you are just not able to bear the responsibility. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yeah, uh, turn if you would to Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. You know, we need to be content with the abilities we have because what is the goal, you know? The goal is not to just um, to be the coolest or whatever or to be seen as somebody great. The goal should be to increase, you know, the talents God has entrusted us with for God's glory, obviously. You know, that should be the goal. We need to increase his goals because remember, those talents, those aren't the reward. The reward comes later. Those talents are Christ's goods and we need to increase his goods for his glory. It says in Luke 12, 48, for unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. So just remember, you know, if you have a lot of talents, you know, whether the, those are people you need to work with or resources God has given you that you need to work with, you also have great responsibility if you have a lot of talents. Now, go back to Matthew 25, to this parable. Matthew 25 and verse 16, it says, and you should keep a finger in Matthew 25 probably, in verse 16 it says, then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And there we see that a talent is a type of currency, it's money. So whatever those talents are, you know, it could be, as I said, people that God has kind of entrusted you with, that you need to work with, that you need, should bless with the abilities you have. Those could be some resources God has given you. Whatever those talents are, you know, 
there's one talent every one of us has, for sure, which is everybody has the Bible. Everybody has the word of God. And God has entrusted us with his word. And we need to work with his word. We need to increase, you know, that resource that we have. We need to go soul winning, you know. We need to put it to work. And that's really the greatest good we could ever have. You know, the, the greatest good is really God's words, having the Bible in our hand, you know, all the time available. And everybody has this talent, you know. Everybody has some talent. Whether, you know, it's, it's you know, whatever those talents might be, but everybody has at least access to the Bible, access to the Word of God, no matter where you are in the world. And this becomes really important when we uh, talk about the guy with the one talent, because, you know, a lot of you probably already know the parable, you know, that the guy with the one talent just isn't saved, he goes to hell, but yet he has one talent, right? So we're going to get to that later. Now we need to take heed that we read the Bible, obviously, but that we don't just read the Bible, that we also live the Bible, that we put the Bible to work, you know, that we live by the Bible, that we put the Bible to work, that we go soul winning, that we bless people with whatever God has entrusted us with, most importantly, with the Bible. And, you know, I already said soul winning. Yeah, that's obviously something that comes to mind when we read verse 17. It says in verse 17, and like was he that had received two, he also gained other two. Now that reminds us of the verse, he that winneth souls is wise. You know, he gains other two, he that winneth souls is wise. So that's the best example, obviously. You know, when we put the Bible to work, we preach the word out there and we get people saved. You know, that's obviously our main, uh, main goal in this life, our main task. Uh, the most important thing we could do in this life, amen? And it says in verse 18, and by the way, don't, don't become like uh, OCD, you know, where you try to figure out every single little detail. Oh, it says he gained other two, so does that mean he just won two people to Christ? You know, it's, it's just an example, and if you disagree, like, how I interpret this parable, you know, that's fine because obviously there could be multiple interpretations. There could be multiple different principles we could derive from a parable. Like you don't have to agree with every single point. You know, I'm just saying this is something, you know, we should do obviously with the resources God has given us, especially with the Bible that God has given us. We should go soul winning. We should gain, you know, we should win people to Christ, obviously. And it says in verse 18, but he that had received one, went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. So he's just, he just isn't doing anything with the talent he has received. And this reminded me of a guy that, and, and turn if you would to Romans chapter 10, by the way, Romans chapter 10, verse 18. This, re, this reminds me of a guy who, you know, we, we knock on a door and he says he's Christian and he, yeah, I have a Bible at home, you know, but he kind of just puts it in a bookshelf. He hides it somewhere. Or maybe it's still hidden in his U-Haul box or wherever it is. He has a Bible, like he has one talent, but he just hides it. You know, he doesn't do anything with it. He doesn't even care. He just hides it somewhere. As you know, this guy isn't saved. You know, we get, uh, that's the last verse, verse 30, where we clearly read that this guy with the one talent is not saved. Yet God has given him this one talent, you know, which is, I believe, you know, it's the word of God because everybody has at least access to the word of God. They could at least hear the word of God. They have a Bible at home maybe, but it's on some bookshelf, you know. Yeah, I have a Bible somewhere, I don't know where it is. Well, maybe, you know, you should use it, you know, maybe you should read in it. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 18, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. So don't tell me that there aren't people, that there are people who don't have access to the word of God at all, you know. There's this guy somewhere, he, he just never heard of Jesus and whatever, you know. I don't care, you know, the Bible says 
that their sound went into all the earth, the sound of the preaching went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. You know, and in, I believe in the prophet Isaiah somewhere, we read that, that even the islands have heard the word of God. Because what are, what are the, the ends of the world? Those are basically, you know, when you get to the ocean, that's the end of the earth. Well, but what about the islands? What about people on islands? Have they access to the word of God? Yeah, and we read that, for example, in the prophet Isaiah, that even the islands heard the word of God, you know. No matter where you are, at the end of the, the earth or on some island, you have access to the word of God. You know, if you're seeking for the truth, you will get access to the word of God, even if you just hear the words. You know, but that's enough. God has entrusted you with at least one talent. And you need to react to that and to do something with that. And I'm going to get to that later. So basically, this guy here with the one talent, you know, he had the chance to get saved. He had access to the word of God, but... You know, he just hid his talent somewhere. He dig in the earth and hid, hid his Lord's money. You know, he didn't do anything with it. And it says, go back to Matthew 25 and verse 19. It says, Matthew 25, verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto, said unto him, sorry, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord, of thy Lord. So obviously we need to be faithful with what God has given us, whatever those talents are, those resources, those people we need to work with or whatever. You know, we need to be faithful stewards. And he says, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Don't ever think... Well, it's, it's just a few, it's just, you know, all these details, it doesn't really matter. Yes, it does matter what we do as Christians. Yes, it does matter how we serve God. Every single detail of our life matters. We should serve God in all our areas of life. And we need to be faithful stewards with what God has entrusted us with. And if we just, if we were just faithful over a few things, we will be, we will, uh, be made rulers over many things, you know. We could be rewarded with ruling over a lot of cities or whatever in the millennium, and we could receive great rewards. But we need to be faithful, obviously, and that's a great teaching, one great principle that we can learn from that, obviously. Then it says in verse 24, Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. So basically this guy is very insincere, you know. I don't know if you noticed that, but he's, he's basically lying, in my opinion. Like he, he's saying, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawed. He's kind of a bit flattering him, flattering his boss. Because obviously this is a worldly example Jesus is giving. It's just a worldly, non-spiritual example, and we can apply this. We should apply this to spiritual things. So, um, you know, this guy in the parable, he's just insincere because here's the thing. If you were actually afraid of your boss, wouldn't you make sure to work as hard as you can and not just hide the talent that he's given you? Like, how is he actually afraid of his boss? He's not. You know, he says, and I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Like, how does it make sense? He's just insincere. You know, he, he's not fearing his boss. If he actually feared his boss, he would work as hard as he could, you know, and, uh, and do something with those talents, increase those talents. Because remember, those talents aren't our rewards, you know. Those talents aren't gifts we get. Those talents are his goods, and we need to increase his goods. We need to... Obviously, God's soul winning, save people. We need to bless people. We need to 
you know, serve our brothers in Christ in practical manners and what and whatnot. We need to increase those goods. And if, if we fear God, you know, we would do something with his, with his talents, right? But this guy does not fear God. Or in the parable, you know, he's not fearing his boss. He's just insincere. So he's basically the kind of guy who realizes that, yes, there is a God. You know, we knock on a door. You know, yeah, I believe that there is a God. And, you know, he kind of believes that God will judge the whole earth one day. And he will decide that who's going to heaven, who's going to hell. Yeah, he's kind, he kind of believes that, you know, like the basics. But he's not saved, you know. And um, he, when it says in verse 24, I knew thee that thou, thou art in heart a man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Like he's realizing God will judge the whole earth, even where Jesus himself, you know, didn't sow the word, where Jesus himself didn't straw the word. Because Jesus obviously was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel mainly, not to the Gentiles mainly. But, uh, you know, we then go out to the Gentiles and sow the word there in other places. But God in the end will judge the whole earth, even, even where Jesus didn't sow the word himself, if that kind of makes sense. So he, he realizes God is the judge. He will decide in the end, you know, but he doesn't actually fear God. You know, he's very insincere. And he, he kind of reacts like that. Well, you know, it's, it's not my place to judge. Have you ever heard that? You know, it's not my place to judge who goes to heaven and to hell. Well, you know, but the Bible tells you, you just need to believe the Bible and you have access to the word of God. You have access to that talent. You know, it's not my place to judge who goes to heaven. You know, God will decide in the end. Well, yeah, God will decide, but God already kind of has decided who goes to heaven and to hell. You know, it's those who believe in Jesus, they will go to heaven. So there we have it. And uh, it says in verse 25, And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast, that is thine. So the only thing he's really afraid of, you know, he's not actually afraid of God. He does not have the right fear. He has a wrong kind of fear. He's afraid of making a decision, basically. He's very indecisive. Like, he could just, he could just do something with the talent, right? You know, but, you know, he, he is just afraid and kind of hides it. Instead of making a decision, he's afraid of making the decision to basically, in a spiritual sense, put his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, to just trust the Bible, what the Bible says. You know, people who say there are a lot of different opinions out there, you know, a lot of different religions. And, you know, it's, I'm not a theologian. I don't really know, you know, I don't care if you know, you know, I just told you what you need to do. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to, you need to make that decision, you know. <laughs> like you, you need to actually fear God and don't uh, try to, when Jesus is coming again, then try to flatter God. Well, you know, I, I was afraid and, you know, I hid thy talent in the earth. You know, that won't count. Like you need to make that decision now, obviously. And it says in, in the same chapter in verse 26, His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not. So he's saying, yeah. That's true, what you said. Thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own money with usury. So one really important truth we can derive from that is that God expects even unbelievers to react to what they have been given. God holds even unbelievers accountable. They bear responsibility. They are entrusted with at least one talent. And that's a really important truth. You know, it's, uh, if that is a verse they heard, or maybe a Bible was given to them, they need to do something with that. Yes, I get it, they're not saved, but they, they could do something with that. You know, they need to react to the one verse they heard in the entire life. They need to react to the truth they hear somewhere to the Bible somebody gifted to them. Don't put it on a bookshelf, don't hide it somewhere, don't put it in a U-Haul box and leave it there. And I'm not talking to you, obviously, I mean, you guys are safe, but you know, this is still a great truth we can, you know, kind of derive from that parable that God expects unbelievers to react to what they have been given. And um, 
it says in verse 30, you know, just to show you that this guy actually is, is clearly unsaved. In verse 30 it says, And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's kind of a hard truth, right, to realize that unbelievers, you know, God will tell them someday, you know, the wicked and slothful servant. It's basically saying, you know, go to hell. I gave you one talent. You could have done something with that. Cast ye the un unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But, you know, realizing this truth that God's, God holds even unbelievers accountable and they bear responsibility, this helps us out soul winning because, you know, obviously we have a responsibility to go soul winning. We have a responsibility to do a good job. You know, we want to do a good job, be effective and everything. Yes, we have responsibility, but, you know, especially you think a lot of new soul winners, they have this impression that they need to do, like, I, I haven't done enough to get this person saved. And, you know, what if I had done this or that? But, you know, some people just don't want to believe. Some people just don't get saved. You know, even if you did a good job. You know, let's say you did a good job. You explained everything. You, you tried to compel them to come in and everything. But they don't want to believe. Well, you know, then they don't want to believe. Like it is what it is. And it, it helps us to realize this, that God's, holds unbelievers accountable, they also bear responsibility. It's not just us. Like when we get to heaven, God won't be like, well, you know, what's wrong with you? All these people who went to hell, why, why didn't you save them, huh? Why haven't you saved them? Well, they didn't believe. Like, I, I, can, I don't have a special trick to tell you how to get somebody saved. You, you tell them the gospel, they have to believe. There is not some special trick. If they, don't, if they don't believe, they don't believe, you know. So obviously we want to compel people to come in and, you know, try to help them to understand the gospel. Preach to them multiple times if you can. But, you know, some people, maybe it's just not their day. They will get saved another day. You know, some people, people will never get saved because they refuse to believe the gospel. Or they even hate Jesus Christ. They will get, become a reprobate, you know. Like, you, it's not in your country. It's, you don't have control over that. The only thing you can control is, you know, to do a good job and to do your part, your responsibility, be a good soul winner, explain everything correctly and so on. And um, yeah, just, just keep in mind that you're not the only one who has responsibility. Some of the responsibility, you know, they have to bear. They need to do something with that talent they got. You know, they need to react to the word they hear. They need to react to the Bible. They need to re react to the preaching, whatever it is that they have. Whatever light God has given them, you know, they need to react to that. <clears throat> so, you know, you may ask, well, what could an unbeliever do with the Bible? What could they even do with that? Let's say somebody gets a Bible for the birthday, some, some unbeliever. You know, what could they even do with that? Like, could they even understand the Bible? Well, obviously not, because turn in your Bible to... 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 2. You know, I, I hope my accent is not uh, too much of a distraction for you, that you can understand everything. But um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, but the, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So, Obviously, if somebody just has a Bible, you know, I just want to use this example for the one talent, a Bible, which is a pretty good example because everybody can have, have access to the Word of God. You know, I think that example makes sense. Everybody, um, I mean, in the U.S., everybody probably has a Bible somewhere on their phone. Like, go on Bible.com at least. <laughs> like, there it is, you know. Everybody has at least access to the Bible, so... But, but the problem is, if, they, if an unbeliever reads the Bible on their own, they won't get saved. They don't get it. You know, they, they could understand, you know, you know, some timeline of a story, but they c couldn't understand, like, spiritual truth, like how to get saved. You know, John 3.16, this is what it says. You know, but now what do you need to do to get saved? Well, I don't know. Keep the Ten Commandments, you know. 
they obviously don't get spiritual truths. It's, it's foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them, these uh, spiritual truths, because they are spiritually discerned. But let me give you, turn your Bible to Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8. Let me give you a biblical example of what an unbeliever should do with a Bible, if he has a Bible. Acts chapter 8, it says in verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and read him the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? Excuse me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. So that's a biblical exam example of somebody who's unsaved and they have access to the word of God. They have a Bible. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. What should an unbeliever do with the Bible? Well, maybe ask some Christian in their life, you know, what does this mean? You know, you know it seems like an important book. You know, it's talking about like heaven and hell and stuff. Like, what do I need to do with that? And again, God is holding unbelievers accountable. They have responsibility. God expects unbelievers to do something with that Bible they got. You know, ask somebody how to get saved. Obviously, most people don't do that. You know, go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 20. You know, obviously, that, that doesn't mean... Just because most people don't care, most people are not like, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, that's not the normal story out soul winning. But just because most people don't care, we don't want to just write off people. You know, we don't just want to have a no care attitude. I don't care, you know. They don't care, so I don't care. That's, that shouldn't be our attitude, obviously. We shouldn't write off every unbeliever who doesn't come to us like, what must I do to be saved? It says in Romans chapter 10, look down at verse 20, But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. So we should reach those people too who don't seek after God, you know, who don't look for God who have an I don't care attitude. You know, we should reach those people too, obviously. That's uh, basically the major reason why we go out soul winning, you know, to reach people who, who don't care, you know, and to, to make them care. Like, look, this is what the Bible says. Like, you need to care about this. Because, you know, there's this other parable where, um, you know, uh, the, the master sends those workers into his vineyard and he agrees with them, you know, about w how they get paid. And um, there are these guys, they, they are still in the 11th hour in the marketplace, just, you know, just standing around, just, just doing nothing. You know, nobody gave us a job. Well, you could have started looking for a job, right? <laughs> like you could have done something with the one talent you had, but they don't do anything. They're lazy, they don't care, you know, but we should reach those people though. Because what does the Bible say in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 20? I was found of them that sought me not. You know, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. They weren't looking for a job, but, you know, we need to give them a job, so to say. You know, we need to go to them who don't care and make them care about what the Bible says. You know, and show them the gospel, show them the truth, and so on. You know, we are not Calvinists who believe that God just gives people faith and some, some people he just doesn't give faith to. And that's basically what Calvinism teaches, right? And, you know, it's, it's so funny how Martin Luther, obviously I'm from Germany, so Martin Luther is like really big in Germany and he gets celebrated every year. I don't know why, because he is probably in hell 99%. That's, you know, what I believe from what I've read about him about this uh, reformer, Martin Luther, and um, he, the way he explained sola fide, faith alone, which he didn't believe in, you know, the way he explained it is basically, well, you know, if, if a baby gets baptized, they, they uh, become, or if, if somebody gets baptized, they become indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit works faith in them. And then because of that faith, they are saved. So they are f saved by faith alone. Makes sense, right? No, it doesn't. It's dumb. It's retarded. 
Like you get the Holy Spirit once you believe in Jesus Christ, not before you believe in Jesus Christ. Then like the Holy Spirit is working faith in you. So, okay, what about the people who don't receive the Holy Spirit then? They won't get faith by God, given to them by God, and they will go to hell. You know, Calvinists, you know, have a no, I don't care attitude. You know, then there are obviously, obviously some Calvinists, you know, there are different flavors of Calvinism. Some Calvinists are saved. I don't want to just pronounce them all unsafe. That wouldn't be true either. But um, basically, you, you know, if, if Calvinists were honest, they would do no evangelism whatsoever. Or like, like the really hardcore Lutheran guys, they would just baptize people. I baptize you, I baptize you, you all get the Holy Spirit and you get faith and by faith, sola fide, you get saved. Th that's dumb, right? But you know, um, what did I want to say? So, if, if Calvinists were honest, you know, they wouldn't do any evangelism at all, no missionary work, because God just gives you faith, and then you get saved. You know, Acts chapter 1630 obviously says, Source, what must I do to be saved? And they said, nothing. I don't know. Like, either God gives you faith or, faith or not. You know, I don't know what to tell you, man. If God doesn't give you faith, you're screwed. See ya. Is that how we go soul winning? No, we, we tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and they shall be saved. Because it's, it's their choice. It's their responsibility. They need to do something with that talent they got. Right? They need to react to that. They need to do something with that. They need, they need to trust the word of God. They get preached. They need to ask somebody, hey, what does this mean? I have a Bible. You know, it talks about heaven and hell. You know, it sounds like a bad place. I don't want to go to hell. You know, they need to do something with that. So, we want, obviously we want to compel people. You know, we want to reach those who are not looking for God. And, um, but at the same time, it is helpful, though, to know that uh, God holds un unbelievers responsible uh, so that we don't think like it's just our responsibility to get people saved. You know, yes, we, we have a great responsibility to go out soul winning, but in the end, they need to make, make a decision though, and it's their decision. You know, if they had a Bible, if, if, if they just, has, just had a Bible, just this one talent, like the greatest good you could have, right? The word of God. You know, if, if that's all they have and they didn't even care about what it says, well, God will be like, you know, thou wicked and slothful servant, go to hell. I mean, it's, it's, it's sad, but, you know, <laughs> they need to do something with that. So verse 30, the last verse of this parable, kind of connects this worldly example that we see in the parable connects it to something obviously spiritual where it says in verse 30, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And maybe if you don't agree with my interpretation of the parable, at least you have to agree though that verse 30 is talking about going to hell. Like that is obviously what it's talking about, you know, there are different principles, different uh, kind of things we could derive from a parable. You don't need to agree with every kind of interpretation, but one thing is very clear when, it, uh, when Jesus reconnects this worldly example to something obviously spiritual that this is talking about going to hell in verse 30. There is no discussion about that. And, you know, what I said earlier in my sermon we derive doctrine from clear scripture, from clear statements, you know, not from parables. So one mistake, you know, especially uh, heretics, false teachers make on purpose probably is that they would just apply a parable, like every single detail, you know, to their false doctrine. They, like they, they don't want to realize it's, it's just an example, you know. And they're just hell-bent on saying that every one of them is a Christian. Every one of them at least was saved, you know. Maybe the guy with one turn just lost their salvation. But I know that they were a Christian because it says servant, so they had to be a Christian. Why, though? Like, it's, it's just an example. You know, it's just a worldly example of a master and his servants, you know, of a boss and his workers. 
you know, it, it doesn't mean that every one of them was actually saved. Obviously, you know, the guys who receive rewards, you know, they were saved, yeah, of course. But the, the guy with the one talent, he clearly wasn't saved. He was never saved, because once you're saved, you're always saved, obviously. And <clears throat> that's very important to, to mention, because a lot of people would say, or not a lot of people, but there's this weird teaching out there that says, well, we know that all these people are saved because it says servants. Like, that's the wrong way to interpret a parable. You don't go just with the parable first, you go with clear scripture first, then with the parable, you know. And you have to, you know, what, what I derive from that parable, how I interpret that, it has to line up with clear other scriptures, right? You know, they, they have the, <clears throat> they do it the wrong way, you know. They, they say, we, we know they are saved because it says servants. No, it's not. we don't know that. And that's why uh, where it says in verse 30, Outer darkness, it's not talking about hell. It can't be talking about, about, about hell because servant, that is a Christian. So, okay, let me ask you this. So they, they get to heaven and this teaching, teaching is out there. You know, I didn't invent that crap. You know, they say, well, you know, they get to heaven, but it's like outer darkness in heaven. Like what? Like that doesn't make sense. Obviously it's talking about hell, that they get cast out. Cast out of what? You know, they don't make it to the kingdom of heaven. Every believer will, will make it into the kingdom of God, into the millennial uh, reign of Christ. Every believer, not just the ones with many rewards, everyone. If you get cast out, you aren't saved. You know, it's that simple. But, but they say again, you know, they are saved because it says servants, so outer, outer darkness has to be something different. Like, yeah, they, they go to heaven, it's just that they lose out on rewards. That's how they explain it. You know, it's obviously heresy, you know, because it is talking about hell. Like, read Matthew chapter 8, you know, that the, that the children of the kingdom shall be cast out, and, you know, there shall come many from the east and from the west, and shall sit with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, and so on. So there's the kingdom of heaven and the worldly kingdom of Israel, you know, Obviously, the Jews mostly did not believe in Jesus Christ, so they get cast out. You know, they go to hell. But Gentiles from the east and from the west, they get to sit in the kingdom of heaven. They, get, they got saved. But if you get cast out into outer darkness, guess where that is? That is hell. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh yeah, so I, I get to heaven, you know, or I, I come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But uh, no, actually, I don't make it because, you know, I lost out on rewards, and then there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, but you're still safe though, you know, you're still in heaven. No, that doesn't make sense. That's retarded. So, obviously verse 30 is talking about going to hell. Again, a scripture you should look at is uh, in Matthew chapter 8. And weeping and gnashing of teeth, look that up in the Bible, it's always talking about hell, obviously. We won't cry, we won't, we won't have uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth in heaven. That doesn't make sense. Now, there is this grace evangelical society out there. They have this free grace theology, and it sounds really great. Like, you know, I believe in free grace. Yeah, obviously free grace. But here's the thing, though. There's this free grace theology. It's like, a, I don't know, like a loose theological movement. And there's this uh, grace evangelical society and free grace alliance. And first of all, they are not King James only, okay? First problem, you know, you should never listen to guys who are not King James only. Like, what do you want to learn from them? They don't even have the right Bible, so nuts to them. But, um, you know, they actually teach the, this kind of stuff that, yeah, the, the guy with one talent, he's saved. It's just that he loses out on rewards and then, you know, he has weeping and gnashing of teeth, but, you know, he's still saved. He's still in heaven, though. I mean, this is what they teach, and it's, you know, honestly, it's, that is damnable heresy, because no matter how they try, how they are trying to twist that, and to make it into something else, this is talking about hell. So they are basically saying that there are believers who are, who are going to hell. When they, they don't go to hell, just that they lose out on rewards. No, it's talking about hell. You know, so this is heresy, obviously, what they teach. But, you know, 
One thing I, th I just mentioned that because a lot of young people, I see that on Instagram, for example, even young NIFB Christians, you know, they get sucked into, into this kind of free grace stuff. They think, well, it says free grace in their Instagram bio or whatever. So they are one of us, you know, they believe the right gospel. But a lot of times though, they are into this free grace theology and they have these weird views that, you know, outer darkness isn't actually hell. It's just losing out on rewards, but we know it's hell. So if you're saying that a believer will be cast into outer darkness, you know, this is heresy, first of all. And also this free grace theology teaches that once somebody got saved, it doesn't matter if they become a Muslim or an atheist, they are still saved because they once believed in Jesus. No, they never believed if they turn a Muslim or an atheist. That's what the Bible teaches. You know, because you get involved by the Holy Spirit once you get saved and you get sealed by the Holy Spirit, you won't stop believing. So what they're doing is, you know, and, and people get sucked into that and think, well, free grace sounds great, but no, it's, there, this theological movement of free grace is, is not great at all. You know, they actually drag once saved, always saved in the mud. We don't teach that somebody who got saved could turn Muslim or atheist and they're still saved because once saved, always saved. That's not what we believe, okay? If they say at the door, you know, I was a Christian, it's because they were never a Christian. All right? They were never a Christian. Once, once you're saved, you will be a Christian forever. You will always believe the truth. You know, you, you don't just turn Muslim or atheist or whatever. So they actually drag the gospel in the mud. The, they drag once saved, always saved in the mud with just, just dumb doctrines. You know, everybody who, who has at least some discernment should see that this doesn't make sense. This is dumb. And obviously, you know, this verse here, chapter uh, Matthew 25, verse 30, is talking about hell. Like, how do you want to twist that? You know, and it's, uh, I, I think a lot of people struggle with this parable. Because you could think, well, they are servants. You know, what's going on here? Why is this, servant, this one servant cast out into hell in outer darkness? Well, it's just, it's just a parable. It's just an example. Like, don't overthink every detail. Just because it says servant, it doesn't mean that they're all saved, okay? But not only that, you know, like wicked kings in the Old Testament, they got called servants. Because, I mean, in the end, everything uh, has to work out, you know, according, so, you know, how should I put it? Obviously, everything in the end, even what the devil does, you know, Ultimately, God, God's will is performed, you know. So, even unbelievers, you know, when they go to hell, you know, it's, it's sad. We want to, as long as they have a chance to get saved, we want to get them saved, obviously. But, you know, in the end, God is glorified, though, because God is just to judge unbelievers, right? So, um, I hope that kind of makes sense. And, um, you know, this was obviously a sermon, not like a super polished sermon with like three points or something, more like a verse by verse study. But there are three important truths, though, that I, I just want to focus on. And I just want you to remember from the sermon. First, God gives every Christian a different workload according to their ability. You know, that's something we should recognize. Everybody has different abilities. Everybody will get a different workload, uh, a different amount of talents to work with. And we should be content with our abilities. And uh, we should obviously be good stewards and so on, be faithful and increase God's talents, God's goods to his glory. So, you know, be content with what you have. And second, we have the greatest good. You know, we have the Bible and we need to put it to work. You know, don't just, just put it somewhere and don't do anything with it. We need to put the Bible to work. We don't want to just read the Bible. We need to live the Bible. And third, even unbelievers have, a, have at least a talent. You know, They have at least access to the word of God and God will hold them responsible. And so that's something we need to realize. That's a great truth. I think we can derive from this parable. Something we need to realize out soul winning that it's, it's not just... You know, yeah, we as Christians are the only ones who can get somebody saved. But at the same time, 
it's not like God will hold us accountable for the people who didn't get saved. You know, it's just that they didn't get saved because they probably didn't want to get saved. So anyways, I hope the sermon helped you understand this parable better and you could learn something from that. And let's just pray.